Polyman. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dan Russell. So I've, I've known Dan for quite some time. Uh, Dan is an alum of UCI. He did his undergraduate degree here in computer science. Uh, he's also, I should mention, a member of the UCI Hall of Fame, which he received in 2013. Um, Dan went on to get his PhD in AI. Uh, this was the first wave of AI at University of Rochester. And then he discovered that he much preferred augmenting human intelligence to AI, so he moved in that direction. He's worked at, uh, at IBM, at Park, uh, and then currently at Google. Um, Dan works in the area of search, and he recently wrote a book which is called The Joy of Search. Uh, I, he just gave me a copy. I'm really excited to read it because it's all about stories. So he approaches search from the perspective of stories. So it really makes you engaged with the topic. Now, I want to tell you a really interesting story about Dan. So when Dan worked, when Dan worked at Apple, I forgot to mention Apple, uh, his team came up with a prototype for a tablet computer. And he went into Steve Jobs' office. This was in 1994. And Steve Jobs started yelling at him and saying, there is no market for a tablet computer. This is a stupid idea. And threw him out of the office. So Dan went to Park, uh, brought some of his team, and they developed one of the early uh, tablet computers. Yeah. Oh. Great. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. Um, the, the Dane and Water, that story was, it then became the Microsoft reference platform for their tablet computers, and you know the rest of that story. Um, so it, I'm very happy to be here to talk a little bit about my book and about search and about software engineering. That sounds like an unlikely trio, but I hope to establish that there's really a, a point of rapprochement between all those ideas. And when I wrote the book, uh, I have to say that the Joy of Search was not the original title. The original title was The Joy of Finding Out. Two weeks before publication by MIT Press, my editor called me up and said, hey, we're changing the title. Oh, really? Yeah, we're changing it to The Joy of Search. And I thought, I said to her, you know, that's going to remind people of a certain age, of either the joy of cooking or the joy of sex. And she said, instantly, we know. <laughs> and I thought, well, all right. And she pointed out that it's just another thing people think they're good at, and they're not. <laughs> so I thought, anybody who's that smart can change the title of my book. So I, I, I did this, and when I wrote the book initially, um, my boss at Google said, you know, why are you writing a book? What's the point? I mean, it's going to be out of date the moment you write it. And I think. A book, though, is more than documentation. And in this case, as Gloria pointed out, it's a set of stories about how to search. And so what I was hoping to do with this is not just teach you stuff, but to capture an ontology of thinking. How do people in the 2000s think of search? And that's sort of the genesis for a lot of this talk. How do we think about these things? How do you consider? How do you understand? How do you discern? So I want to frame this talk by giving you a little bit about what I do, because my job at Google is to be a cyber, tribal, techno, cognitive anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> See, I got better. I used to be a software engineer. <laughs> I recovered. Um, and so what that means, though, is I study how people think about search, how they use information, how they seek it out, with how they process it, and so on. You can think of this as sort of a, a, a kind of a model for how people write systems of software. You have to understand a huge amount about how systems work, both at the line of code level and at the larger ecosystem level. And I am also a software engineer and a research scientist. So I think about this problem of how do people process information in a very specific way. I focus both on individual skills, but also on group skills, social ecology. How do people think about all these things? 
And one of the keystones of my work is really to study how people search. So I could go around and ask you, how do you search? Right? It's an interesting question because mostly people go, oh, I don't know, I just type in some stuff and it works. Um, so I've done hundreds of field studies, hundreds of field studies, more than 300 in the past few years. I teach lots and lots of classes, about 500 classes. Everything from fourth graders to NASA rocket scientists. So it's an interesting spectrum. And I try to understand how each, each different demographic group, how each organization thinks about these things. I also have a, a massive online class called Power Searching with Google.com. And it's had four and a half million students take it. Or another way to think about it is I've been on somebody's little TV screen on their laptop for 350 years. <laughs> Beat that, professors. <laughs> but I have a lot of data from that, and I'll show you some at the very end. The point here for us today is, you know, how do we understand what software engineers do? How do they learn? Certainly, they come to institutions like this and they learn a bunch of stuff. But this is not the end point of software engineering. You continue to learn. And I would argue software engineering is intrinsically interlocked with search. So in a very real, real way, we have to understand how people actually do this stuff. How do you become an engineer and then progress? So let me tell you, how do people learn how to search? After hundreds and hundreds of field studies, I, I will tell you the answer. They learn how to search not from documentation. They learn from friends. Right? So how did you learn how to do that tricky thing in Google? Oh, you saw someone else do it. You looked over their shoulder and said, can you? Gloria, can you show me how you did that? That kind of thing. So the good news, however, from my perspective, is they also learn a little bit from classes. Thank God. <laughs> Otherwise, that, those three and a half million people would be sort of out at the lunch. And the key to this, really, I, I've discovered, is that people remember stories. They do not remember lines of documentation. Yes, you can look up the man page for this stuff, but you keep looking it up, don't you? Right? Because nobody remembers what the fourth parameter is. So you have to keep looking these things up to keep them sort of in your, in your working memory. So how do people think about search? Right? Because at Google, you could say something like this. What is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? And you know what the answer is going to be, right? It's 42. And we give you this handy calculator. Now, in case you need to divide by two or something, right? But what's interesting about this is, if you think about this as a mental model, the mental model of search is what? Is it page rank, the algorithm? If that's true, then this won't work. Right? So maybe it's an Easter egg. Okay, so let's look at this. When it's 10, 10 p.m. in Irvine, what time is it in Tokyo? 3 p.m. is, you know. So obviously, just page rank does not explain what Google is really doing. So what I find fascinating about what I do is I get to go out and watch you. I come to your house and I watch over your shoulder as you do your searching. And if you look in the academic literature, you'll find these beautiful models like this. And there's a million papers like this. And this is the one by Carol Coltow, basically saying there's a five-step process that people go through. They have start up with this goal, they articulate and they try to refine it. And they click on a few pages and then they uh, uh, elaborate on the content. And they, continue searching, they go round and round and round. Have you ever actually watched someone search at home? Yeah, they do that. <laughs> <laughs> they just type, oop, that's not it, type, oop, that's not it, type, oop, right? So I'm interested, you know, obviously there's something else going on. Probably not that. It's probably more than this, right? Because there is some discernment that goes on. So what is it? So, one of the big objectives of my research career is to understand the mental models. Now, we all have mental models for everything. You have a mental model for your car, you've got a mental model for the university, you've got a mental model for how the index in the book works. What's your mental model for Google? Or any search engine? Is it all just keyword searching? If that's true, then life, the universe, and everything, example, doesn't work. So that's clearly not right. Is it full text indexing? Can you do partial text searches? If so, how would you do that? See where I'm going? How does it work? Right. 
Because I can go to Google and type in an expression like this, and I get this beautiful <coughs> interactive model of that complex algebraic surface. Mm -hmm. Now the problem is, people understand this at sort of a basic level. I type x, I get y. Mm -hmm. But the world is not decomposed into stimulus and response pairs. People have a deeper model of things. And unfortunately, a lot of people think of the world like this. Question, how many of you know what that is? <laughs> OK, let the record stand. Everybody over 35 raised their hand. So we have a nice partition of the world. Right? Uh, for the rest of you, students, this is a card catalog. This is a physical index of the contents of a library. In this case, it's sorted by author's last name. Now, if you have this mental model of Google, there are certain things you cannot do because there are crazy things one could ask of an index, like sort by middle name. Can you do that with this model? No, you cannot. Or, I mean, excuse me, yes, one can. It will take you about a thousand years. <coughs> you cannot resort your card catalog in any meaningful way. And people think a lot about, you know, sort of what's inside of Google, what the index is like. And a lot of people will tell me this is their mental model. We have everything 24-7. Every book, every news article, every movie. You probably encountered a case where you couldn't find something. But the interesting question is, what's the perimeter of what's available? What is the coverage? How would you describe it? So one of the things I do in, in, in my classes and in my talks and I should have done it today, is I would hand out an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and say, here you go, draw me a picture of how Google works. Draw me a system diagram, draw me whatever you want. And I've asked about a thousand people, I will tell you a thousand sheets of paper is about that high, about a meter high. <laughs> but this is one system diagram drawn, drawn by a computer scientist. It looks very reasonable to you and me. It's got an index. Uh, generating mechanism. It's got web crawlers. It's got this uh, query parser at the top. It's kind of very reasonable. All of us would probably draw a diagram like that. Okay? What does the rest of humanity think? Because I have to tell you, computer science majors are not in the majority. Right? The majority of people draw diagrams like this when trying to explain to me what Google is and how it works. The caption at the top says, Several overlapping concentric circles and nonlinear Boolean targets. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> okay. And so when you ask people to explain these things, they, kind of, they try to do a good job. But they're limited by their model of how these things work. Now, here's the really interesting data point for this. One third of them have the word magic <laughs> in the diagram. <laughs> These diagrams all come from, ready, university students. That means roughly a third of the university students have no functional model for how Google works. Now, of course, if you don't have that model, then you can't extrapolate. What can you do in addition to, right? So what defines your mental model? Part of that is what your expectation is of certain actions. So if I do x plus y, I want to get the result of the addition of those integers, right? Or whatever. But what about this query? How old is Donald Trump's wife? What do you expect the answer to be? What's your mental model? Let me, it's not 42. <laughs> Here's the answer. There are three answers. Right? Now you think to yourself, well, yeah, that's right. He did have three wives. <laughs> But the normal human, human protocol is, I'm going to tell you the age of the most recent wife. Right? But Google doesn't think like that. So how is it functioning? How about something like this? What color is the sky? If Google has this simple sort of text retrieval model, then you won't get a simple answer like sky blue. Nor could you ask a question like this. What color is the sky on Mars? How deep does knowledge run in Google? What's the system implementation of knowledge? So the implementation of this, the answer to that question is it's yellow-brown. If there's a picture, right? how did it do that? Have I broken your model with Google yet? 
Because there's something going on between question answering, between parsing natural language, knowledge search, as well as text search. So the quantity of all this stuff, just so you understand, is sort of staggering. We have more than 20 million books uploaded to Google Books. We have lots and lots of images, including 82,000 anteater images. I counted. I don't know why there are 82,000 anteater images. Some of you have been busy, obviously. So it's big. And it's an interesting question now. What can you ask? So here's a question you might ask Google. What was the population of Japan in 1490? That is not going to give you a useful result. Trust me. How about this? How much did the Empire State Building weigh? You can compute it, I know you can, but do you include the weight of all the water and all the pipes and all the toilets? <laughs> oh, I didn't think about that. Why is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea a classic? You see where I'm going? There's a capability space. There is a coverage of this knowledge that's in Google, and you have an informal understanding of what that is. Or, how much apartment housing should Newport Beach have? <laughs> policy questions. We don't do well in policy questions. Just so you know. So what can you ask? Right? Can you ask this? Does anyone <coughs> read that? Does anyone know how to read that? After it, transfer, Google translate and then give it the right. English. <laughs> okay. That's true. And I will tell you it says Ethiopian flag. <coughs> First question, how do you type that? <laughs> What's the input method editor for that? All right, you see where I'm going? So yeah, you can actually put that into Google. Uh, you can copy paste it and make it easy. And it will give you the answer because we scan every document that, that's in Amharic. And that's a very simple search for us. Okay? So what else can you ask? So I just said, if you've got a text representation of these things, you can search for them. Well, what about that? <laughs> there is no Unicode for Mayan glyphs. Good luck. You're SOL. Can't do it. So what I think is interesting now, turning our attention towards software engineering for a second, what can you search? Because I've had people at work tell me, I can't search for stuff like that. Right? What is that? What is that operator? Does anybody know? Just if, curious. How many if people? And only if. Pardon? If and only if. Close. It's the null safe equal oh, no. operator. But the point is, if you're a programmer, you might want to look up that kind of thing. Here's the big thing you need to know. There are still people at work who tell me, oh, I can't search for that stuff. Google software engineers tell me this. But I type it in and it kind of works, right? What do they not understand? And this is going to be a recurrent thing. What do they not understand? They don't understand, we replaced the bottom level scanner a couple years ago. Yes, we replaced the jet engine while we were at 35,000 feet. So the thing that actually breaks up HTML pages into tokens, we pulled that out one day and slipped in a new one. You never noticed, did you? And we didn't tell anybody, but now we index all those special case characters. So you can go ahead and ask questions like this. So if you read particular kinds of programming languages, these are all relevant queries. They were not answerable five years ago. It would basically say, oh, square brackets? We don't handle square brackets. We just drop it silently. We wouldn't tell you that, but that's what happened. But now, of course, the, that first expression, you can look it up and get the answer. The second expression goes like that, and the third expression looks like that. Great. What's so interesting about this is from, if you're a professional programmer, a professional system engineer, this is going to save your rear end multiple times. <laughs> so it becomes an interesting question now. What you can ask of Google? What's your mental model? My son walks in like this with this on his arm. Question, do I need to go to the ER? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't take it. <laughs> it was a spider bite. I knew what it was. Um, uh, but it looks, like, uh, it, it looks like a tick bite. It, it, it wasn't. Luckily for me. Um, but nevertheless, you would use search by image for this, or would you just type in a textual description? How would you convert your real world <coughs> presenting problem into a query? This happens all the time in software engineering, right? I've had a lot of people come up to me, engineers at work, say, What's that operator that compares this value with that value? It doesn't break when the first value is null. Oh, yeah, yeah, you want the 
and then I tell them, and then all of a sudden it becomes easy to search. So the language matching problem, particularly to complex situations like this, is non-trivial. We still have to work on this. And when you start to think about what the system knows, what Google knows and understands, you start to wonder, well, how much can I rely on an image like this to tell me what's correct? It's an interesting problem because we now have apps that are built that run on your phone that identify flowers. You probably have those, right? It says, oh, that's a hydrangea or that's a whatever, right? So there is an app that will identify mushrooms. Looks like that. All the reviews say five stars. Only the survivors give it reviews. Dead <laughs> <laughs> right. people don't rate this thing. And so it gives survivor bias a real concrete notion. Right? So how do you how do you learn? So the mental models in this case are, are extremely variable. When I talk to people, some people will say, yes, you have everything that, you know, possible. Um, or the alternative is, you know, 95% of everything is crap. There's multiple, multiple kinds, right? You obviously know there's code available online. There are system architectures available online. There's pictures, there's MP3 files, all this stuff, right? How well do people understand what's possible to do? So because I work in research at Google, I've learned lots of studies. I'm going to show you a couple here. Here's one of the ones I ran a couple years ago. I asked people in the search group, search engineers, not just random search engineers, but search software engineers. Find a picture, an aerial photo of this house taken before 1977. I gave them 15 minutes because, you know, if you can't find something in 15 minutes, we know you're not going to pursue it. Okay? Nobody out of my group of 250 software engineers could find the answer. Like, really? So I thought that was interesting. And so I went to Mechanical Turk and I did the same thing with 2,000 Mechanical Turkers. I found one person who did it. Gloria was one of them. She was actually, she found a, a good solution. Um, so here's the thing that surprises me. If you go to Google Books and type in something like aerial image, blah, 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 um, you can find this book on page 32. There's a lovely photograph of that area of downtown Palo Alto, taken in the 1930s. Or, this is Gloria's solution, you can find historic aerial imagery website and you can get that image. If you want to zoom in more, you got to pay money, but yeah, that's good enough for me. But the thing that surprised me the most, and maybe this surprises you, is that there's a solution within Google that every engineer should have known about, and that is to use Google Earth. Did you know that Google Earth has historic archival aerial images for basically the entire planet? How many, anybody know that? Okay. Well, let's say three, I'm going to give you four, just right. Is this a total failure of marketing, or is it a failure of mental model? The thing that deeply, deeply surprises me is if you go to Google and say, Aerial Imagery Archive Google, it will say, hey, use Google Earth. Why did nobody do that? It's not hard. Once you do that, you can go to Google Earth, pull the time slider back to 1940, and get this beautiful picture of downtown Palo Alto and that house. And then you can zoom into your heart's delight. So it's an interesting question. When we build a system, we build in a kind of implicit description of what it does and how it works. Right? So for example, you probably know you can do image search and find this picture of Saint Chapelle, glorious chapel in the center of Paris. But did you know that you can use Street View and look around inside Saint Chapelle? So you can actually check out what's behind the scene and move around in that space. Likewise, you can go to the Australia Great Barrier Reef and fly around underwater. I'm not doing this to demo that as much as I am trying to convince you that you need to understand capability space. Right? If you don't understand the capability space, you're kind of stuck. If you don't know that, for example, Google has an archive of images or, or entire newspaper runs going back to 1905, then you'll never think as a historian to go search for this. What do we need to need? What do we need to know about this? First article: the capability space. 
So chapter two of my book is basically an illustration of this. Chapter two starts with this question. It, it's basically, somebody sends me this photograph and says, okay, I know Dan, you can figure out where this is. Great. I want you to figure out the phone number of the room where I'm standing when I took the photograph. How hard is this? Would you even start this search challenge? So I'll tell you what I did. And you can go read the whole book you know, to get the chapter two. But basically, if you look at the very top, there's ampersand TP. So it's like a toilet paper company or something. But if you search for TP office building, you'll very quickly learn uh, that there's a bunch of photos of that building. And you can learn that that's called Telecommunica Polska TP. It's in downtown Warsaw. Once you do this, you can very easily figure out the street address. Okay? So it's there. That wasn't the question. The question is, where's the photographer standing? And what's the phone number there? Right? So obviously they're in a building somewhere. So what would you do next? Google it. Google it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to understand what capabilities are in Google and what are in the different apps that we, we serve. So for example, in Google Earth, you can turn on 3D buildings. And once you do that, you can fly to that location in Warsaw, because you know where the street address is. You fly there and just fly around in flight simulator mode until you get to the physical location that looks the same as the photograph. Photograph on the left, model on the right. Then what do you do? They did not teach this to you in database class. What do you do? Turn around. <laughs> there is no join and foreign key here. It's just turn around and look at the bottom and you'll figure out it's Emily Plotter 53, okay? downtown Warsaw. OK, we're getting close. How do you figure out the next step? If you go back to the original photo, you'll see in the center of it this kind of blur, blue blur thing. And you, as sophisticated photo lookers, would say, oh, that's a reflection. So I can reverse that and recognize that that's the Google logo. Ah, like, oh, reflection off the glass. He's standing in the Google office, which I should have figured out actually ahead of time, but I didn't. So once you do that, Google office is Warsaw. There's the phone number and the fax number should you need it. Okay? What's key here, what just happened is that I went from one step to another step to another step to another step. Basically searching for a path that takes this input, <coughs> that output, take that output as input, do the search for that, and so on and so on. In old AI terms, we call this stepwise planning. Okay. It also tells us if you could link those stories together, you, you can do it. Sometimes you have to change the data into something you can recognize. It. Okay, but now you know some capabilities. Now mm -hmm. this is something you can now do. So, question. What kinds of things can you find online, right? It's an interesting question because it's a fundamental question for all information resources. For anybody who's writing code, you need to know what's possible. For anybody who's trying to search for stuff, you need to know, for example, that Google now has got this events search capability. Here I am searching for jazz concerts near me this weekend. Did you know you can search for events as event types? So the, in, in computer science space, these are first class data types, events. And you can then filter and search query on all those different properties. For medical kinds of information, we put together these knowledge panels you see on the right-hand side. These are, as far as we can tell, the highest quality sort of short summaries of these things. They're very reliable. Or if you look in Google Patents, you can type in a patent number like I've done here, and you, it pulls up a patent that I filed about some, some drone thing. But over there on the right-hand side, it says find prior art. We've got this fancy dancy natural language processing system that delegalizes patent language and finds next nearest neighbors. So you can click on that and it will tell you all the patents that are prior art that is filed before that patent was filed. Okay? They may or may not be referenced by that patent, but they're materially related to that patent. So an important thing to recognize is stuff like this changes constantly. So what worked five years ago may no longer work today, or what was impossible five years ago works today. Let me tell you a thing to know about Google. 
we have a major push basically every day. So everything is constantly in flux. New capabilities come online, new data types come online, new information resources come online. How do you learn this stuff? Let me show you a, a quick video here. This is a guy who's in our lab, and we asked him this question uh, using Google, can you find something to do in San Francisco on Saturday night? Now, ignore the pink dot, that's just eye tracking data. But listen to what he says. He's using an old prototype version of Google, so don't worry about the UI. But listen to what he says in order to try to satisfy the question we ask him. So, well, I want to try and do one last thing. Okay. Can we do thing? Okay. I'll see what happens. I'm a TV show kids. Oh, see? They're not giving me a chance. <laughs> They're yeah. not for kids. No wonder I could not find. <laughs> and you should try my belt. Okay. Do this. <laughs> see? For this activities. Cut the video. The next modification to the query is adult activities, San Francisco, Saturday night. And I can't show that to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did this guy not understand that there's potentially NSFW content out there? Did he not get the memo that the internet is for porn? <laughs> what happened? He doesn't, doesn't understand that it's probably a bad idea to do that query with my young female research assistant there. Right? <laughs> so this is an interesting question. And, and so chapter 17 of my book, next to the last chapter, is about understanding where the boundaries are for capabilities, for content. And so a couple of years ago, I was um, in the Aegean Sea, and we stopped at this island called Delos. It's there. It's a great place. I recommend it to you. It's the birthplace of Apollo and Diana in Greek myth. Okay. It's one giant archaeological site. Fabulous. And you go ashore, and you go on a tour, and they walk you around this house, this villa, this amphitheater, and so on and so on. And the end of the tour is a stop at this piece of marble, which is the upturned pediment, the bottom of the temple of Apollo and Diana. Okay. It's the big temple on campus, basically. Now, when we looked at that, I thought, oh, wow, lots of graffiti. That's too bad. But then I noticed one of the graffiti was there. It's, uh, I'll read it to you. It says, M.C. Perry, 1826, USN. Now, if you're a history buff like I am, I thought, what? Really? Matthew Calbraith Perry was in the Aegean Sea in 1826? It's a quick reminder. He's the guy who opened Japan to trade with the West a couple of years later. So, was this guy on that island in 1826? Hmm. So I started doing the, uh, the obvious pieces of search, and you go to Google and you do this kind of search for his name and quotes and a date and year and all that stuff. I can find books about that, but it's all sort of wishy-washy and ambiguous. So I think, you know, I know what to do. I want to find the logbook for the ship he was on. I know he's on the USS North Carolina, a ship of the Maine, out of Baltimore Harbor, sails to the, there, and I thought, well, go to Google Books, and I can find a non-promising looking text, uh, book here, which is the finding aid called The Guide to Non-Federal Archives and Manuscripts in the United States Related to Africa, Alabama, and New Mexico. Like, what? This is a finding aid. How many people know what a finding aid is? Okay. You're a historian, aren't you? <laughs> I know your title. It's, it's, a, it's basically an external <coughs> index to the holdings of a library or archive. So I discovered this one said, oh yeah, we know where the logbook is. And I rode my bicycle over Stanford because they had the one copy in the entire West Coast there. And I write, write over, I turned the page, you know, five million. And it says, oh yeah, it's not here. It's in the Eleutherian Library, Wilmington, Delaware. <coughs> so I go to Wilmington, Delaware. <laughs> And I take the Amtrak from New York City, because I went to Google New York, and took it down. And I go to the Eleutherian Library, it looks like this. And they hand me this logbook from 1826. And I turn to the page, and it says, they're there on Delos, and that's it. Because it's a logbook. It doesn't, it's not like chatty. 
So it's a lat, lat long weather, time of day, and it says, on this day we were... So it turns out there's another book, another copy of the logbook in North Carolina Chapel Hill Library. Luckily, I know a graduate student there. I call her up. She goes over. It's exactly the same. Then there's a third logbook, and it turns out it's at the Library of Congress Archives. So next time I'm in D.C., I go to the National Archives, go there. I pull the logbook, I flip to it. It's exactly the same. It looks like this. Basically, on the bottom, it says, standing aside the south side of Delos, and they're there for a few hours. I'm depressed. I'm sitting there in this chair, and what, that, that blank space is me. And it turns out the archivist of the United States happened to be walking by. He happens to say, what's wrong? Well, I explained the whole story here. And he says, oh, you don't want the log book. You want the letters. What do you mean, letters? Well, it turns out the practice at the time, if you're on a ship and you send a, like a letter to your, your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife, is that they would make a copy and keep the copy because delivery was not guaranteed. They didn't have a decent protocol for this. So they would keep track of all the letters, keep a copy on board the ship. When the ship comes back to the United States, they all go to the archive. Okay. So he shows me how to fill out the form and we fill it out. I asked him, how did you know about this? He said, well, I, I happen to be a specialist in 19th century sailing vessels. <laughs> <laughs> so I pull this out, and I've got a, a little bit of time. I'm reading through all these letters, and it's like reading somebody's email from the 19th century. So I'm reading you know, the letter to Minerva, his wife, and I learned how to read that. <laughs> it's actually English. <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like it, but I learned how to read that. Um, I'll spare you the decoding process, but here's the thing I, I found on June 3rd, 1826. In red, I have at this time on board the North Carolina as many relics of one kind or another as would load ten wagons, and among them number two white marble altars from the temples of Apollo and Diana at Delos. Smoking gun. So not only do I know they were there because I got the ship's log, I have the letter to Minerva that says, we went on shore and committed archaeological vandalism. <laughs> and we've actually got those altars that they then left the graffiti on, the pediment, the thing below it. Right? Great. So I know they're there. I know they did it. Fine. When I sent the book off to my editor, she said, so where are the altars now? I'm like, fine. So I didn't put this in the book, but I'll tell you. Um, they got into a storm off the island of Rhodes, and they dumped them. That's all I know. <laughs> I don't know where off the runs. Right? It's really deep over there. Anyway, the point of chapter 17, is it's got a lot of these lessons, like how to do these kinds of steps. But the most important lesson, really, here is not everything is on the web. I have a lot of interviews in my stash where people say everything is on the web, everything is on Google, and it's not true. It's not even close to true. Right? So sometimes you actually have to go to the library. Now, you have to have these sort of fundamental skills. We've talked about some of them, like chaining, like you know, using double quotes and so on. But the fundamental skill for most search is knowing how to find text on a page. Now, you all know how to find text on a page, right? Control F or Command F. If you're on a Mac, it's like that. If you're on a PC, it's like that. But I was interviewing this young woman, and she's going through this, this web page for many minutes, like 10, 15 minutes, I thought. What are you doing? She said, I'm searching. I'm searching. Know any other way? No. She doesn't know this. Doesn't know this. So, you have to know, this is less than one mile from the middle of Apple Campus, in Cupertino. She doesn't know how to find text on a page. Interesting. So I thought I'd do a study. So I did this experiment. I asked a lot of people, here's a web page. Find for me how long it took Beth Smith to run this race. So this is the results of the flag game. How long did it take her to run this race? How long would it take you? 10 seconds max, right? So here's the result. And the thing that kills me about this is there are people over here, 300 seconds. Mm -hmm. There are more people that didn't fit on the chart out here at like 500 seconds. You can divide by 60, right? So that's interesting that the people, there were clearly people who have no clue what this is. 
What's fascinating about this is once you get on beyond 120 seconds, two minutes, a quarter of the answers are wrong. <laughs> what do you mean wrong? This is like the most trivial question ever. The answer is actually on the page, I guarantee it. All you have to do is like copy, oh, you don't know cop, you don't know control F, you don't know control C, control V. So what people would do is they'd look at the page and then go back to my survey page and try to remember the numbers. <laughs> and they'd swap a couple. <laughs> or they put the colon at the end. Okay. So I thought, that's fascinating. I'm going to just do a quick survey. And so I surveyed a couple thousand people and I found out that 90% of people in the U.S. that use the internet don't know how to search text on a page. You're kidding me, right? I asked a couple thousand um, uh, uh, English teachers in the U.S. Same thing. I did a survey of 90, uh, uh, three, uh, 50,000 Firefox users and discovered 93% don't know this. No comments about Firefox versus Chrome users, but whatever, right? They don't know it. I presented this result at work. I stood up like this and gave this presentation. In the back, in the cheap seats, there was a statistician friend of mine who said, that can't possibly be true. <laughs> no way. So without telling me, he went off and ran his own study. And two weeks later, I'm in the back seat, and he's up here saying, yeah, Russell was wrong. I thought, what? <laughs> he said, it's 91%. <laughs> <laughs> Okay then, um, there's lots to understand about what people actually know about what's available on the web and what's available through Google searches. So I started making kind of a list of the different kinds of genres and different kind of media objects available through search. Stupid, but you know, I made an initial list. And this one is really interesting and important, spoof sites. You all know what a spoof site is, right? It's a site that somebody puts up that's clearly just, it's for fun, we're just gonna have a good time. So here's one. The Pacific Northwest tree octopus. There is no such animal. Yes. Nevertheless, every year, about a thousand sixth graders write learned articles for their high school teacher, for their teachers at school, <laughs> about this animal. The irony is this site was created by a teacher to teach web credibility. <laughs> and he's utterly failed. And people run across these kind of media objects all the time, and they imbue them with more credit than they should. If you, for example, do a search for Pope Francis Miracle, you might find this video. <laughs> I have friends who believe that's true. <laughs> And it's an interesting question, you know? There are all these things out there. And we increasingly live in a world where video is important. Every minute we're here, 400 hours of content are uploaded to YouTube. So even if 0.1% of that is relevant to your domain of study, to your particular interest, you're already behind. You can't possibly watch even the video about your sub 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 specialty let alone all the other stuff that goes on. What I find so interesting about this is there are about a billion views of YouTube per day, a third of which are for learning purposes. It's people looking up, how do I install Linux on an XYZ box? How do I set up Kubernetes to do whatever, right? How do I get AWS? So people do these kinds of searches on YouTube increasingly. And it's fascinating to me because it, it's a fundamental question about what can you ask? So a couple years ago, my son, at the time was 16, uh, he came to me and said, you know, there's this song that people sing at Stanford basketball games. Anybody know what this song is? Nobody knows what this song is. And he said, you know, I want to find that song. I want it on my phone because he's a real basketball fan. So, could you use Shazam or Soundhound or one of those things to do it? No, because it's a thousand drunken Stanford fans, right? <laughs> and those only work with nice, clean digital copies, okay? So, that ain't not going to work. So, I think, I know what I'll do. I'll do lyric search. What are the lyrics? <laughs> oh, 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 okay. yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, he said, Dad, you work at Google, right? What can you do? And I said... Give up. 
So my son immediately ignores me and types in O O O O song, and the first hit is a link to the song which he now has on his phone. What did I miss? Where's the memo? In my case, I didn't understand that there's a huge rise over the past few years about question answering sites. Think Stack Overflow, right? There's a million of those things. And a few of them say, that song that goes, oh, 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 that's Zombie Nation by Kern Craft. Right? And he found that. So if you think, you know, I did a survey of a bunch of people at work, a bunch of software engineers at work, and I asked them, well, what do you search for online? So they search for things that you would expect. Code samples, you know, error codes. Right? Error codes, yeah, they copy paste the error code from their compiler and figure out what's going on. You see that this, this is the kind of thing people deal with. Now, what's hard about these kinds of searches? What makes it hard? Well, it's kind of stupid stuff. Like, let's give our programming language the name Go, because that's a <laughs> rare word. <laughs> right? Or let's name our stats analysis package R, because that's so distinctive. Right? It's massively hard to do decent. Well, I will tell you how to do it. You have to do R or Go or Dart or whatever, and you add a couple extra terms like statistics or something like. So provide a little context. Otherwise, we're kind of holding the bag for you. We don't know what to do. So that's one way to do it. And as I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of people complain about special characters missing. But as I told you, we've just changed that. So all those funky operators now work. So there's a couple of things I want to make sure you know before I quit for the day. Um, there's a few things that all system builders should know about. How many people use site colon there? Okay. Site colon stack overflow, if you want to just re get results from there, that is a limiter function. So you can do your query for regex in JavaScript, right? Or if you're looking for, a, say, a regex tester, site colon whatever, right? Um, how many people use in URL? Anybody? Yeah, nobody knows this. I'm going to make you 10% smarter right now. Okay? <laughs> In URL searches for that string in the URL. And you know how people write URLs. They often put in clues like, you know, link, developerlinkedin.com. Uh, that's not the site, that's in the URL. It's a link to whatever, right? Uh, you can also use wildcards in site specifiers. So you can say site colon www.star.nyc.gov. Uh, it will look all of those subplaces. And of course, file type, you know how that works. All these people taking photographs. <laughs> I'll send you the PDF. <laughs> Just ask. Um, anyway, you get the idea. Now, of course, you can combine these things. You can say in text Java, that forces that text to be on the page, a couple keywords, uh, in title, and so on and so on. Right? If you're going to be a professional system developer, you kind of need to know this. Because the guys at work, do searches like this on Google, external for code stuff, about anywhere from 20 to 100 times a day. This kind of stuff makes them incredibly much more productive. And I want to close with, with this observation about people and their credibility or their gullibility with respect to stuff they find on the web. This is a big issue for the United States or for the world, right? You find something and it's either fake news or crappy re results or something, and yet, it's an important skill for people to have, and yet we're bad at it. We're really bad at it. So here's a site that a friend of mine said, you know, this is about the EPA, and it seems really weird to me. Now, you as literate web savants understand that this is kind of weird, because it's epa.com. Like, what? I thought it would be .gov, but whatever. And if you're in high school, you don't know what .gov means. <coughs> so if you go there, you read EPA facts is a project of the Environmental Policy Alliance dedicated to highly high cost of the environment protection. Like, I'm confused. Environmental Policy Alliance, EPA, okay, spider sense number two goes off at this point. Okay, now look at the logo. Now let's look at the real EPA.gov logo. Does that worry you? It should. Because they're clearly spoofing the real EPA. So what are you going to do? What advice can I give to you about checking the veracity of websites like this? There are a bunch of them. I'll give you one. Let's look up the physical email, uh, physical address of environmentalpolicyalliance.com. That's the street address. Okay? 
I'm surprised that the EPA fits in the suite 800, but eh. So now, of course, you can take that street address and do a search for that, and you'll find there's another company in the same suite. That seems really weird. So now it tells you it's permanent company. Now we can search for permanent company, and you'll find out they are not the same as the Environmental, Environmental Protection Agency, which is on Pennsylvania Avenue, but they are a big pharma, big ag, big oil lobbying firm. Okay, so now you know from whence this came. You know the spin, you know the angle. Now, a really frightening and surprising piece of data from my colleague Sam Weinberg at Stanford is that 80% of university undergraduates cannot do that thing I just walked you through. 80%. Let's go grab 100 random undergraduates out there. Prediction, 80 of them will get it wrong. I don't know about you, that worries me a lot. So this is the kind of thing we need to be able to be doing, right? We need to teach our, our, our students, ourselves, these search skills so we can understand what's possible and what the space of credibility is. We need to understand what a content convention is. For my part, as a representative of you know, large technology companies, we need to figure out how to design these things and communicate this internal structural stuff much better. We need, as faculty, to teach our students these things as well. So, as I mentioned earlier, I, I have this course, online course called Power Searching with Google.com. About six hours of stuff. And here's the best chart of my life. So, this is an analysis of, of I think this is, the sample size here is uh, 300,000. Right? So, it's pretty, pretty reasonable. The, the thing you want to notice is the, the section in blue <coughs> is the two weeks when my students are actually in the course. They come in at about a point four level of skill. They go through the course and they zoom all the way up to like 1.8. And I think as a teacher, as a faculty member, yes, I have quadrupled their skill. I'm a great teacher. But faculty, close your eyes for a moment. What happens is as soon as the class is done, they immediately start forgetting everything they learned. But the good news is they only went down to 0.8. That means when they left my class, they were twice as good as when they came in. I'll take that, right? <laughs> Thank God this is not organic chemistry, because that number would then go to zero. <laughs> right? But they practice it. They use Google every day, so I know they get reinforcement on this stuff every day. I've got another data point, which I, I don't have on this slide, which is six months later. They're still performing at 0.8. So it's a persistent change. So yes, faculty, you can change your students persistently. So I also write a blog um, where I pose questions like this, like that's where the, uh, the Warsaw question came from. And this is all now in my book, right? So the point of all this is basically I'm trying to communicate to people through the mechanism of these very easy to understand stories how to do these magical seeming tricks with search. Because I don't think it's an option, right? I think the goal of all this work is to learn how to be an effective searcher. This is how you can recognize that BS content, or that sham website, or that low quality story you just read about. So I want to augment the intelligence of ordinary people, right? I want my sister, I want my brother, I want your sister, and your brother, your mom, your dad, to understand these things. Because face it, as engineers, as software people, we have created an immensely complex information landscape. So in some ways, we have made the problem worse. So we need to think about how can my piece of engineering fit in and amplify this and not make the problem worse. There's a lot one can do about this, but I think from my perspective, my hope is to be proactive about this and help people to understand what the space is, what the actions are, and how to be better consumers of information. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> is there a protocol for questions? Yeah, there's yeah. a few All right. Yes. Why would you even need to search for the address of the EPA? Wouldn't the fact that the two names are different be a dead giveaway? <laughs> Yeah, so the question was, why do I need to search for the address to begin with? Wouldn't the difference in names be a dead giveaway? If you're an adult, yes. If you're in high school, no. And it's, it's not a trivial comment. I've had high school students, for example, ask, is nationalgeographic.com a reputable website? Seems weird to me. They have all these weird people in the front. 
So as an adult, you've learned a lot of contextual world knowledge about this kind of stuff. So you recognize the difference in names. But high school students, a lot of them don't know that EPA stands for Environmental Protection Agency. So yeah, if you have that context, yes. But a lot of people don't. So this is a way to get around that. Uh, I wonder, when you do Google search, does uh, Google use uh, user's identity to uh, adjust search results? Uh, yeah. So uh, it's a great question. Um, the question is basically, does Google personalize the results? Like all things, things change every time. So six or seven years ago, we used to personalize results. We stopped doing that. And I know you may think you're getting personalized results. You are not. Mm -hmm. The only personalization we do is by geolocation. So if you do a query for pizza in Irvine, it's not the same results as pizza in New York City. And a lot, there's a lot of that effective geo stuff. So that's the only personalization we do. Uh, your history, your searches, all that stuff. Sorry. Um, you mentioned now several times that you're constantly updating things and new things are new capabilities yeah. are rising. All right. Are those logged anywhere so we could find out what new things are there? <laughs> Gary Olson asks a very reasonable question, <laughs> which is, so you're changing things all the time. Do you keep track of that? No. <laughs> Oh, so, so that's, that's why I write my blog, basically. Um, so just today, in fact, I wrote a blog post about uh, data search, data set search. Uh, so if you don't know, we now have this new service called data set search, Google <coughs> data set search. And you'll find it. And it basically allows you to search for data sets. And you put in a descriptor of the kind of thing you want to search for. But we did put out a, a, a tiny little press release about that. But if you're a data scientist, you want to know about this because it indexes all of Kaggle, for example, and a bunch of other resources you know about, but it's all in one place. So I think we've got 25 million data sets in there right now. That's more than you're gonna find with just a regular Google search. So, so I wish it were other, but that's why I had a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody over here? Yes. Are there any time uh, constraints um, in terms of how far Searches go. Uh, you of course are looking possibly on the, as you mentioned, in yeah. some context, geographical. Yeah. But you also. Yeah. So the, the time constraint. Let's say I just look yeah. for twenty years back. Uh, I see. Forty. So we put. Or yeah. Do we need to go in and say set for? So the web, as we know it, didn't exist a hundred right. years ago, but. Um, that doesn't stop pages from having dates that old. Because of the, like you mentioned, the, yeah. the so, photograph. So the, the, the question is about can you uh, search for content by date? And the answer is yes. So there's a tool, click on tools, and then you'll see the option on the left about uh, filter by time or date, I forget what it's called. Um, the one you want is custom search. So you can say, uh, search everything from January 1st, 1900 to January 1st, 2000. It gives you the previous century. And, right. and, and it applies also to like the uh, searches, uh, scholarly searches, as well as the patents, or yes. just the general? Yes. So does it work for patents and search, and Google Scholar search? Yes, it works actually in all different corpora, images, scholar, patents, blah, 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 everything. However, the quality of the dates on the content varies tremendously. There's all kinds of stuff we know was first seen on the web, say, in 1999, but the date on the web page is, you know, 1950. Someone's lying. And so the metadata quality is, in, in general, terrible. On the other hand, for patents, for scholar, for books, that metadata is pretty good. And yes, I know people complain about books metadata all the time, but we didn't just make that stuff up. We imported it from libraries and from digital publishers. So they give us crappy metadata, we do our best, right? We try to fix as much of it as possible. But I have seen, for example, first edition or origin of species, pub date, 1999. We didn't just make that number up. Somebody gave it to us, right? So, anybody else? Yeah, very interesting. Um, so thanks, first off. Uh, my question is, you know, look at it from a question and answer from, you know, I'm questioning the computer, the computer gives me an answer. Does it also work on the other side 
where somebody's questioning based on my input. You know? Like, who is Peter, which is my name, right? And what's coming up today? Right. Oh, okay, so let me see if I got your question right. Um, one, one que you could ask this question about, you know, for example, personal data. Mm -hmm. okay? So one of the things you can do is say in Google, um, uh, show me my pictures of fish. And it will look in your personal photographs mm -hmm. and find all the pictures of fish that you've got, even if you haven't tagged them, because we do image record and stuff like that. So, uh, for example, one of the, one of the I didn't put it in this deck, but uh, I can go to my photos and say, show me pictures of my daughter by a lake. And it knows what a lake looks like and what my daughter looks like. Now, it doesn't work in general. It doesn't work on Google Images broadly, mm -hmm. but it works for my photographs because uh, I've given it the, the how to recognize my daughter. The very cool thing about that is that when I did that last time, there's a picture of my daughter. There's no lake in the image. But I happen to know that she's standing right next to Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. So it knows the geolocation where that is. There's a massive lake right next to her. So in fact, it's, tr it's correct, even though it doesn't look like it's correct. So there's a lot of interesting processing like that that's going on. So yes, you can get access to your information. But if I did that, what's Peter's schedule for tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get anything. I, I, I can't share. You can't share my your data with me. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. uh, so with the, all the privacy stuff and how people start talking about like a CPAA, we start CPAA, uh, California. CPAA, yeah. we started this year. GDPR in 2018, I think we got yeah, right. like yeah. dollar in Europe for, for something yep. last year. Yep. So how do you do you think there's some interaction about how the search perform with all the new consideration about privacy stuff? Yeah, well uh, first off, yes, there's a bunch of that stuff. And an interesting problem from our, our perspective, from a system perspective, is that every region has a different implementation. <coughs> Europe's got GDPR. Brazil's got something else, you know, uh, Japan's got something else, uh, South Korea's got something else, and so on and so on. Um, so we have to follow all those localized regulations, and that's kind of a, an expense for us. Um, does it affect the overall performance of the system? Absolutely, right? Be, for example, in Brazil, we have to keep all of the content of everybody from Brazil in Brazil. We can't ship it out to the United States data farms. For example, and so that's a, you know there's a lot of reconciliation that's going there. We can't strike things over multiple data centers the way we'd like to. So it's a cost. Uh, there's no way around it. So we have to we have to buckle up and, and just do it. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Thank you, everybody. Hey, okay, I appreciate it.